Yeah. Um, I hope everyone had a great summer break. Um, I hope maybe you got some rest and relaxation that was a little different, maybe a change of scenery or something, I hope at least during the summer. Um, the History at Home series, as you know, started right when we shut down and uh, we decided that even as things are opening up, we're gonna keep going on with them because they really meet a need. And as Sharon said, you get to see so many old faces and friends on here that it's kind of nice. So um, we are gonna continue them, but on an every other week basis. I'm also introducing a new show um, that will air for the first time on September 22nd on Zoom. We're calling it, You Must Remember This, because Herman Hupfield was from Montclair, as most of you might know. Um, and it's basically also an interview format. Um, some of you may know Donato DiGeronimo, and he is basically our host, and he's just gonna chat with people um, and talk a little bit about what it was like growing up in Montclair and some of the organizations and activities that they were involved in. So that is on September 22nd, very informal. Grab a cup of coffee, a glass of wine and join us. Um, I'm going to pause for a moment and just share my screen because I want to thank everyone who has supported us um, over the summer and throughout the pandemic. Um, really, while I love um, getting the donations, I love the kind words that have come with it, I think even more. Um, you can do it in three ways. You can do it on our website, montclairhistory.org. Just go under the donate button. Um, you can do it on Venmo. If you type in Montclair History Center, it'll pop up with my name, but it really does go to the History Center. Or you could simply write a check um, to the Montclair Historical Society and mail it to us. We're going in fairly regularly now, so we should be able to say it that that is pretty much it, except for introducing Betty. Um, Betty uh, is, is an amazing researcher. Uh, she was originally started out as a teacher at Columbia High School in Maplewood at Newark Arts, um, and then also at Passaic County Community College. She started her interest in this um, uh, when she began working on her own family genealogy. It moved from there into St. Mark's um, archives. And then from there, she went on um, to begin to do this research. And what's interesting about this research is um, she was asked by Dr. Shirley Lewis to do a presentation on some of the women who were part of the YWCA. And Betty herself was a uh, member of the board of trustees on the uh, YWCA. And so Betty launched into her research and discovered um, the story of Alice Huey Foster. And she knows a good story when she finds one. And so she began to look at it um, as not just a story about Alice, and that's my dog, not just a story about Alice, but also a story about Montclair and the growing African-American middle class. So with that, I am gonna mute myself so my dog stops barking and I'm gonna turn it over to Betty. And Betty, you can share your screen and once again, ah, oh, Thank you. And I wanted to mention, we were really lucky earlier today to have three of the Huey family descendants. And I know at least two of them are with us today. We have um, Alice Carter and we have uh, Denise Carter possibly with us. Uh, we also had Debbie Bashad join us today, but I'm not sure she's gonna be with us tonight. But thank you for joining in. This is one of the wonders of having Zoom because we could actually bring people in that otherwise wouldn't be able to join us on these kind of programs. So delighted to have them, delighted to have Betty, and thank you. Take it away, Betty. It's so nice to see so many friends. Um, it makes it a lot easier. I told Jane, every time I do this, I've done it several times since 2017, but every time I do it, I get nervous. At any rate, thank you, Jane, because I think there's nothing that I enjoy more than talking about the story of the Huey family and the impact that they had on the township of Montclair. Um, Jane mentioned that we were talking about the black middle class. And when I'm talking, my primary premise of when I talk about the black middle class, I'm thinking of home ownership and um, money in the bank investment. And I'm thinking of possibly uh, entrepreneurship. Um, in Montclair, you will find variations of all of that, and it's been here in, in that way for years, I think. So, um, 
the um, story that led me to uh, Alice Huey um, was conversations that I frequently had with um, uh, Hortense, but I never acted on it. And uh, Hortense Ridley Tate, who is the first person uh, on this picture, as you enter the Crane House and Historic YWCA up at the History Center, this is what you see. And so Hortense and I talked about it, and it was always a curiosity in, in the back of my mind. Uh, the bottom picture is um, a younger picture, I think, of Alice, um, who is uh, the founder of the Montclair YWCA. And so, you know, oftentimes we talk about a person in, in the singular, um, but she was Alice Huey Foster, she was married. But there is a story behind each of the persons, and I wanted to know about her family and you know how did she get here uh, to Montclair. So that story for me started out once I did the research with the uh, first of the great migrations from uh, 1870. Uh, what I found was that uh, the Hui family was. Um, my, had migrated here from Loudoun County, Virginia. Um, Charles Wesley Huey and Sarah Turner Huey were married in uh, 1870, and he was 21 and she was 17, and they had three children, three boys, as a matter of fact. And um, in, um, they moved to Montclair, I believe, in 1874. And I'll tell you later why I believe it was 1874 during that year that I believe that they um, moved here. Um, many of the migrants who were coming to uh, Montclair after the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, there were advertisements. And I think Jane wrote an article about um, uh, such an advertisement where Montclair was looking for workers to uh, come to town. And um, so Charles Wesley and Huey and Sarah Turner Huey made their way to Montclair. Um, the population data that I was able to find through uh, the help of some work that Elizabeth Shepard and uh, through Henry Whitmore's book, uh, the population data that I was able to get was, you know, from 1870, there was 36 African Americans. And by um, between 1868 and 1876, I saw another source that said the general population was 4,000. So I don't know if they included African Americans in there, but I could never find that particular information. But one thing we know for sure was that five additional people had come, the Hui's. Um, so uh, in uh, Whitmore's book, he also reiterates why African Americans were coming to um, Montclair because of the uh, job opportunities and the greater salaries that were offered them here in, um, in town. And um, with that bit of information, uh, Jane introduced um, I now consider them friends of mine. One of the uh, Hui descendants um, of one of the of Alice's sisters that you will meet later. But she found some interesting information that she shared with me. And I'd like for Denise to uh, come on and talk about that information because it had particular interest to me about their move from Loudoun County to Montclair and they didn't seem to move here as uh, to be a servant in anyone's home. So Denise, would you share with us what you found? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Betty, and thank you to the Montclair uh, History Center for, uh, for the, the presentation. Um, and I, I just want to say that Betty and, I, and, and my family found each other uh, because you post these things on YouTube, and um, I am sort of an ancestry sleuth, um, uh, I've, I've really been uh, doing a lot of investigation and then meeting Betty really accelerated that. And one of the documents that I was able to find um, is a document uh, from the Freedmen's Bank 
Um, and it is a record um, that goes back to 1874. Um, it's a, a, a document that shows that uh, back in uh, March of 1874, Sarah Hoey uh, had uh, a deposit there at the Freedmen's Bank. The Freedmen's Bank was, you know, one of the, I guess, the first financial institution that was set up, uh, you know, post-emancipation. It only was in place for about six years or so, but it took deposits of African-Americans and Sarah Huey had an account. Um, I have a document that's dated um, early March, 1874. Uh, it lists where she was born, Claiborne County, Mississippi. Um, it notes that her husband is Charles Huey and it lists uh, the children, Clifford, Charles, and, and William. It's got her actual signature on there. Um, it does not say uh, what the uh, amount is that she had on deposit, but I thought it was really interesting that it was in her name um, and, and not her husband's name. Um, which brings me a certain amount of pride. You know, uh, uh, we have a, a long line of strong women in our family and just to really kind of indicate that these were people of means. Um, it's not clear like where on deposit these funds were, but um, you know, it just really underscores the, uh, the, um, the fact that, that, you know, the Hoey family, you know, came into Montclair with, uh, with some funds and, and some means. So it was a great, link in the chain and um it was really exciting finding it and um thank you betty for giving me the chance to uh, to speak on it thank you denise because it also uh added to the to what i think my understanding is because for each time that i found uh charles hui or any of the hui's in uh any kind of record here um it appeared that they were uh, tenants until they got to the point where they were able to buy um, their own home. And what we're looking at here, we know Montclair was incorporated in 1868, and they began to keep uh, the their tax records in 1878. So this is the first tax record book that you're looking at here. And so I found Charles Huey, you see the arrow pointing to him, and the COL means colored. And you see that he's a tenant of uh, W.S. Uh, Morris, that's William Morris, who had a hardware store on Bloomfield Avenue. And you'll see that picture also uh, further. But what was interesting about this was that Charles Huey was paying a poll tax of $4. And um, so from the very beginning of their coming here, um, they that to me means that they were invested in the the community. I was also interested in whether or not there were other uh, African Americans who were paying a poll tax. And so I just combed through every page in that 1878 book and came up with 16 names. And um, where you see, uh, for instance, Ed Edward Brooks at Philip Doremus, that meant that they lived in the home uh, as a servant to that particular family. And there were four families that were listed as tenants. And you see at the bottom left column, uh, Charles Huey was a tenant in the W.S. Morris um, building. And um, so I thought that was, you know, really interesting because it kind of, it gave me the feeling from what Denise was able to find that they um, really were able to um, get a start on their own. So uh, the African American population is growing. And by 1885, we've got 280 African Americans here. And of course, you know, as the community grows, the institutions to support that community also grows. And one of the first very important institutions in the African American community is the church. And so although this church uh, first belonged to the First United mm -hmm. Methodists, the um, um, the Montclair, uh, once the African American community grew, it was large enough for them to start their own church. So they bought this church. And I did find records where, uh, lots of records where Alice was very active in St. Mark's United Methodist Church. What you're looking at on the right is what it looks like now. The, and what the church looked like on the left. Now. Uh, I have seen some documentation that says that this was the first church in um, in Montclair, built in Montclair, but, you know, I've read Philip Doremus's book, Reminences of Montclair, 
And he says that there's a uh, First Presbyterian Church that was the first church. So I guess that is a, um, you know, a piece of research that will have to be fleshed out. Um, so um, recently I went back to the Henry Whitmore book, which was written in 1894, and, and was surprised to find that um, Alice's name was listed as a part of a group a delegation, if you will, from New York, New Jersey, that started the First Baptist Church, which is up on Church Street. All of us know that church because right now it's called Christ Church. And um, Alice is there. She would have only been 10 years old in um, 1885 as they were establishing that church. But it just shows that, you know, at a very early age, uh, Alice was. Um, you know, it seems as though her family was very invested in being a part of the Montclair uh, community. Um, so moving on from there, the, um, the Hui family has grown and we're in, all of my pictures were silhouettes except for Alice's. Through my meeting with Alice, Alice's namesake, Alice Carter and her daughter, Denise, and the other daughter, Debbie, um, later I met Debbie, I was, they gave me this picture of Evangeline. And I think Evangeline, well, it seems like the Hui family was a very close knit family anyway, but many of her siblings um, participated in activities at the, uh, at the Y. So I'm grateful um, for having that particular uh, picture. Um, I further wanted to look at, um, where did they live during the time that they were here? So combing through tax records, um, I was looking both for um, Alice and for her father, Charles Huey. And the tax records for Charles Huey shows that they lived at these four addresses. And of course, each of them is a step up in their lives as they are beginning to uh, establish themselves. And so we all know this house, 24 Orange Road, where they lived for seven years, uh, which is right across from the new signature Marriott Hotel. Still there, beautifully painted. Um, I'm often tempted to um, ring the doorbell. But uh, I do also have a picture of uh, Denise and Alice in front of the house, which is what I should have used here. Sorry about that, gang. Um, also, what I wanted to do was to do like um, a full picture of how the family engaged in the community through their work life and um, much of their activities um, that they were engaged in, like important committees, mostly uh, for Alice. I didn't include here. I just wanted to get a panoramic view of the kind of work that they were engaged in. And you see their father, Charles Huid Sr., came here, started out as a gardener, then was a sexton, and then advertised uh, in most of the business papers as a carpet layer. Um, Alice uh, was always a house, I'm sorry, Sarah was the wife, was always a housewife, and she worked uh, once the business got established in the uh, new store. And of course, the founders of the new store, Clifford and William, we'll talk about them a little more, but it seems like Charles Jr. Uh, really enjoyed his work as a horse clipper. But later on, he uh, set up, he and another brother, Rosher, set up a uh, bicycle storage and repair shop. So um, some of you may have remembered uh, the documentary that Bob Herbert did called um, uh, the Odd, Against All Odds, The Struggles of the Black Middle Class. Um, he talks about the various types of jobs that were available to African-Americans and that if you were able to start your own business, then that was a real plus in your survival. And he spoke specifically about uh, Ma Claire. And you can see some of the other occupations from the uh, family members. Uh, I started to put as my backdrop this huge spreadsheet that I had to build in Excel to kind of keep up with where they were and what they were doing, you know, over the years. 
So uh, I mentioned earlier that Charles Huey Sr. Um, was a, um, a sexton. Uh, now we, those of us who are in the church, we know there's a difference between a sexton and a janitor. And so uh, the interesting story here for me is that uh, some of the heavy hitters in Montclair, the names like Ed Goodell and uh, Philip Doremus and uh, Dr. John C. Love and, um, and Ed Goodell's wife, who was very active in the altruist society, um, they all left the First Presbyterian Church because of some dispute and built this church. This church only survived for 25 years. They uh, buried the hatchet, cleared it up, left the church and went back to uh, the First Presbyterian Church. So, but for the years that they were there operating, um, Charles Huey was their sexton, but he was also a carpet layer and he was advertising in directories, in the Baldwin directory, in the Montclair business directory as a uh, carpet layer. Um, there was uh, one other very interesting thing about this church that I wanted to um, uh, mention. Uh, they um, advertised this church, uh, Trinity Presbyterian Church, as a free church. And being a person of color, you know, I'm thinking free church meant something else. And some of you may have heard me tell this story earlier that a free church only meant that you didn't have to pay for your pew seat. And I thought that was interesting church history, um, um, you know, from the past. So here, uh, 1889, uh, I have always had a problem with um, this picture and the characterization that that little box that you're looking at all the way over there on the left was the first black business in Montclair. My question was always, how could that be? How could that little box be a business? Well, I found a book by, written by a woman named Gladys Seeger. And the title of the book was Montclair, The Elegant 80s. And in that book, Gladys, the book was written in 1948. And she went through um, all of, you know, how the town, the township commission, it was called then, uh, gave approval to a woman to run a a flower and paper stand there, a fruit and newspaper stand there. Then she sold the business to a man named John Rush. And then John Rush sold the uh, business to uh, the Huey brothers. Anytime you see the name of the Hueys mentioned in earlier publications, you never get any indication that they are African-Americans because they just don't mention that they sold the business to two colored people or African, you know, they just never say that. Um, so when I found that out, I was um, really uh, very interested, but glad that I still had that curiosity about that little box and suspected that it was not a business, but it was a business. So I'm kind of trying to move chronologically here. Um, so the Huey brothers, Clifford and William, buys this business they had previously operated the business out of their home over on orange road that i showed you earlier um, and now alice who has been attending school and has obviously made an impression um, on a number of people in the education community alice has to take a test in order to um, be accepted into the high school and so as you can see handwritten here is um, that she's admitted with conditions. Now there's an interesting story about this document that Alice will share with, with us. Alice would be the niece to um, Alice Huey Foster. So I would like Alice, if she would tell the story of how we came, how I came about getting this particular document. Thank you again for allowing me to be here. Um, I'm quite honored. Uh, like I uh, said earlier, uh, I came across an old Bible after um, my parents had uh, demise and uh, um, evidently this was a part of my father's legacy. And I, so one day I decided to go through it and I came across this document and I was so ecstatic 
And it, what made it even more ecstatic was because I had already met with Betty and um, I really didn't know who, I know I was named after an aunt or something, but I never knew my, my great aunt. And um, so finding this document was really meant a lot to me. And, um, and I have to thank Betty for getting, uh, getting involved with this and, and, uh, and I'm just finding this, this information of my family has been the world to me. And um, I just want to thank you for it, Betty. <laughs> so. You are so very welcome. Yeah. I, as I said earlier, you know, I just enjoy having this conversation about this family in, in mm -hmm. um, Montclair. Um, is, is anyone, the, the question often come, come up, uh, comes up, what people say, well, what does with conditions mean? Mm -hmm. Does anyone out there have any inkling what you think that Alice was admitted into the high school with conditions? What would that those conditions have been? Does anyone have any idea? What do you think? I have no idea. I have my ideas. <laughs> <laughs> My idea really is that uh, with conditions met it is if she could keep up with the work, mm. if she could hang in there and stay as a student at Montclair High School, you know, because I don't think at that time uh, education beyond middle school was mandatory. I don't think it was. But yeah. Betty, it's also possible, possible if she's the first African-American woman to graduate from Montclair High School, she may have been the first one to actually go into the high school as well. But with conditions. Well, because they didn't know if she could keep up with it, as you said. Yeah, but not exactly. because of her past experience necessarily in grammar school, right. because of her college. Right, right. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Still, still moving in chronological order, here is a slide from 1892. All I want to demonstrate here is how the Hui's advertised their business and how uh, they were known in town. On, on the left, you see the Clifford and William newsstand at 449 Bloomfield Avenue. And on the right, you see them again under news dealers. Um, you see um, Charles Hui, carpet layer, sexton, his two occupations, two jobs. So he was not a lazy lima bean, I'd say, right? Um, so as the Huey brothers began to build their business, remember they started in that little box, but then they moved on and expanded the building. And if you look at the picture here from the Montclair Times, 1943, uh, if you look at the up above, you see that the Montclair Savings Bank was located on the second floor of this. This was the Morris Building. And down at the bottom, where the striped awnings, uh, awning is, that's where the Hui uh, News and Tobacco Store uh, was located. But big business prevailed, and I think the Hui's uh, News Store went out of business around 1910, because I think that's when this building that Montclair uh, Savings Bank building, which is empty now, um, was constructed and opened there at that corner, at that same corner. So um, there were, um, in, in 1892, there were many changes in, in the Hui home. Uh, they bought a house on Maple Place. Most of us know where the gelati uh, ice cream place is up on, um, Bloomfield Avenue, and that on one side it's called Maple Place, and uh, on the back side, um, of, which is Portland, I think, it's called Maple um, Plaza, something like that. But um, this is uh, where they moved, and they bought a house that on, in the tax record, the value of the house, tax record book, the value of the house was $1,300, but they paid in cash, to Ed Goodell, who was the chancery, the magistrate uh, down in Newark, paid him $3,000 in cash, $3,300 in cash for um, this home 
on um, on Maple Maple Place, and they were the only African American family for um, many years. And we'll talk about when the transition began from eight at during at 1892. Okay, they were the only family. This is a picture, a prized picture that Jane found and shared with me, a picture of the 1898 Spanish American War Parade going down Bloomfield Avenue. You'll see all the way over to the right, some individuals standing on the top of a, a building. Uh, if you could read the awning, could zoom in on it, you'd see that it says uh, Hoo uh, Huey Brothers uh, News and Tobacco Store. And so, um, you know, as fate would have it, um, things happen. And uh, 1894, we're going back, back and forth. Uh, 1894 was a very challenging period for the Huey family um, because of the um, typhoid uh, fever outbreak here in Montclair. Uh, Clifford was one of the first victims uh, of that. There were over 50 people in Montclair who died from the typhoid fever, who were frequent um, subscribers to a farm in uh, Verona called Gould Dairy Farm. And they had been cited for unsanitary practices, but and they didn't make the changes that was um, uh, suggested. But that's a whole story within itself. So Clifford died in April of 1894, and then November, uh, 1894, his brother, co-founder, he succumbs to consumption, which we know is tuberculosis. But, um, you know, through loss, there's also joy. Alice graduates from Montclair High School, becoming the first Ameri African American to do so. And she goes on to attend Howard University and makes her way to a teaching job at a boarding school uh, in Marshallville, Georgia. And Charles Wesley Huey, purchased a family plot at the Mount Hebron Cemetery in 1895. So this is uh, Alice's June 21st, 1894 uh, graduation program. Uh, you can see it was held at the Congregational Church and I was corrected about uh, this uh, building. Uh, Jane, I'll have to defer to you again about, uh, because I thought this was what the new what the Board of Ed building is, but I was corrected and told that this was a, the new state-of-the-art uh, high school, but it didn't last very long, and it was located where, Jane? It was located, it was located right across um, from, it's basically where the Hillside School's um, fields are today. It was state-of-the-art ah. when it was built. Uh, Alice was probably one of the very, was the in the first graduating class, it lasted for a while as a high school, and then the town was growing so quickly that they quickly outgrew it. It became an elementary school, and then ultimately, it was the Spalding Elementary School, right. and then ultimately it was raised, and it's now just fields at, um, right. at over by Hillside. As you can see on that third panel, Alice was very much a part of her graduation ceremony. Her name is listed uh, down at the bottom for a... Uh, um, recitation that she did. And uh, the 13 names are all the way over there on the, the last uh, panel. So um, the Huey family having suffered the loss of the sons who were the founders of the business. Of course, you know, uh, Alice, who was in Marshallville, Georgia, had to come back home to help with the family business. And uh, their mother, Sarah, began to work there um, more often. And uh, so did the uh, father and several of the, the other brothers. Uh, and Grace, I might add, was the, always the bookkeeper for the family business. Now, this picture, uh, I am delighted, uh, was shared with me by Alice, whom you heard from earlier. Um, this is her grandmother. And this is um, Eveline, who at 15 years old in 1895, married Justin Fitzroy, who lived right across the street from her when they lived on Orange Road. Uh, he lived where uh, the Ferrari auto, auto shop office is, not the new one, but all the way in the back. He, uh, I was told that was the address 
that I found for Justin Fitzroy. Uh, Justin was a bookkeeper. He started off as a bookkeeper and moved. He and his wife lived on Bloomfield Avenue um, for a time. And uh, he became a mailman, a postman. So uh, the period of 1900 to 1930 uh, through in the academic world is known as the golden age of black entrepreneurship. But um, I think in Montclair, we were experiencing uh, a golden age of entrepreneurship a little earlier um, than what this period is. But I think what this period refers to is uh, the growth of a lot of black businesses between 1900 and um, um, 1930. So talking about uh, the golden age of um, black entrepreneurship, uh, the two, two other brothers, Charles uh, Jr., Charles Huey Jr., and the other brother, Rosher, decided to uh, open a bicycle storage shop on Spring Street in Montclair, which is now what you know as Lackawanna Plaza. And uh, there were lots of commuters, of course, and that was right near the train station. So, and cycling was a very popular mode of transportation, even though cars were uh, beginning to be an alternative to the uh, bicycle. So they always had challenges in their business life and had to keep pace. So this building, we've talked about a lot, uh, the current uh, smoke shop at 415 uh, Bloomfield Avenue was formerly known as Huey's Hall. And Alice and her sister Grace purchased this building in 1906, and they owned the building until 1940. Uh, in that building, when they purchased it, and during the time that they purchased it, there was a beauty salon in there, there was a dry goods store, a dental office there. Her sister Sarah was a, a milliner, and she had a shop there. There was a Chinese couple that also rented from them uh, who were launderers. I don't know if their business was in that building or if they just were tenants there, but um, Alice and her husband lived there. And I'm not, I don't think Grace and her husband lived it at 415. But um, this became a, um, a very important uh, part of YWCA life because uh, this, I believe, is where those uh, 17 women uh, met to start the YWCA. So um, I talked earlier about. Uh, the neighborhood where the Hui's moved was all white. They were the only um, African-American um, family that lived on the street. However, by 1908 to 1910, there was a complete turnover, except for the Paladinos. The Paladinos seem to have kept their home there for quite a while, but the rest of it, uh, it became um, primarily African-American, the residences. And as you can imagine, as the population growth uh, uh, continues, um, the number of uh, social problems uh, also grew. And that's where Alice uh, comes in because she was always, always very much involved in wanting to help um, her fellow man and help solve some of the uh, community related problems. Uh, as you can see, in 1920, there were uh, 4,000 African Americans had made their way to Montclair, and the general population was 28,000. So, um, meeting with those 17 women, um, they came up with their first location was at 89 Forest Street. They outgrew that building very quickly and moved over to the Crane House, which we all now visit up at the History Center on their uh, property. Um, these are the only pictures that I have been able to collect uh, of women who met with Alice in 1911 
in the middle is a woman named Roxy Myatt, and that's Sandy Lane's grandmother, who was a part of the group of what became the uh, Board of Management. Uh, Annette Goodell, whom I mentioned earlier, uh, was a part of the YWCA. They, uh, she was uh, the chairperson of, uh, I think the, um, I forgot the name of that group, but they controlled the finances of the Y. And these women controlled the day-to-day -day operations of the Y. But the other woman all the way over on the right is uh, Bertha Sadler, who was also Bertha and uh, Alice were both members of St. Mark's and Roxy Myatt was a member of Union Baptist. So we have to find those other women, seven, those other, what, 14 women, a picture of them at least uh, to add to this collection. Uh, so here on this particular slide, we are just showing that um, by, uh, in, the, in the Hui family between 1920s and 1930s, left to uh, carry on the legacy of the Hui family was Alice, Grace, and Evangeline. And um, Alice, who is um, uh, written about often, is um, memorialized, if you will, in this uh, Thomas Yenzer um, book. Uh, this gentleman was a publisher who lived in Brooklyn, New York, and he vowed to publish uh, this book every two years and to have it located in as many libraries and in the hands of as many people as he possibly could, because his mission was to show that African Americans were uh, productive citizens. And he did a little bio on each one of them and he made an honest attempt. It is written that he made an honest attempt to meet each and every person that was featured in uh, this um, sort of an encyclopedia. So the year that this particular book, this book is located by the way at the History Center. Jane has this copy um, and it, it Although Alice died in uh, December of uh, 1940, there is a page in the beginning of the book memorializing her death and acknowledging the work that she had done and why she had been selected to be uh, one of the persons um, listed in this particular book. Uh, I haven't looked in that book for any other Montclair people, but I bet there are several others. So this is, we took it, um, finding that there was no headstone for, um, for Alice at, um, up at Mount Hebron in her family plot. Uh, all of her family are buried there with the exception of, uh, I can't find Charles Jr. and the last son, Phillips. Um, I didn't find him there either. And I can't find them on find a grave, so you know, the search is still on. But this, we did this in April of um, 2018. It didn't take very long because people jumped on board pretty quickly and we were able to purchase a headstone to place it there in the cemetery, in the Hui family, Hui family plot um, to memorialize Alice and the contributions that she has uh, made to, uh, to the township. Uh, and I might add that um, I don't think I named some of those uh, committees that Alice uh, was a part of. One was called um, the Montclair Interracial Committee. And this was a statewide um, committee. There was one in several townships throughout New Jersey. And in Montclair, uh, Alice was on the executive committee. And uh, Dr. John Kenney was the vice chairperson of that particular committee. There was a lot of racial problems here in Montclair. And so their objective was to bring racial harmony, bring understanding. And so they did it. And then the, there was the NAACP who had a number of issues that they were fighting in town. Alice was a part of the NAACP. And so she was doing her own thing at the YWCA and plus running her business. So, you know, she was a very busy woman 
coming from a very productive and busy family. And, you know, I'm just proud to know her and know that she was a part of our St. Mark's community. And that's the end of the presentation. And I hope you have lots of questions that you'd um, like to ask me. Uh, Jane will tell you that I have cut this presentation down tremendously um, from um, over an hour and 40 some odd minutes to under an hour. <laughs> so uh, I do hope that many of you have questions. I don't have a question. But I just like to um, make note uh, that we do have a couple of people that actually are related to Alice Hoey. Eva had a, obviously a son, Charles, and everybody knows my mother, Alice Carter, but her sister, Albina, is also present on Zoom. Albina, can you raise your hand? So they can oh, see. <laughs> Albina, so nice to meet you. Welcome. Okay. And the second person I like to um, make note is the fact that um, she also had, uh, Eva also had a daughter named Sarah, and Sarah had a son. And that Victor Hoagland, raise your hand, Victor, he's on Zoom as well. Victor? Oh, wow. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. And then there's one more. <laughs> wow. Uh, so many more. Had a, um, Eva had a daughter named Annette. And Annette had a son named Thomas Taper Jr. And I was in contact with his daughter, and that's Nicole Gore. And I don't know if you can see her face. I think I she can. Oh, okay, there she is. So I invited her to the Zoom, so she's on too. So, so Nicole, I would really be interested in hearing a few words, thoughts from you. So good evening, everybody. <clears throat> um, I just wanna say thank you to Debbie for inviting me. Um, did not know a lot about my family history, just found out a lot of it recently from Debbie. Um, as she shared, Annette Fitzroy married Thomas Sr. That was my grandfather, and he had um, Tabor's Drug Store, the first um, Black-owned pharmacy in Hackensack, New Jersey. So we just last week had the opportunity to start corresponding and sharing pictures, so I'm learning more and definitely interested in staying in contact. Oh, it's wonderful. Uh, I, I wanted to say that uh, e, um, Evangeline, I call her Evangeline, Evangeline's youngest son, Donald, uh, attended Howard University and was a dentist. And he came yes. back home and opened a practice in Newark. Wonderful. And so Eva and Justin eventually moved to Newark. I guess they were near him. Um, I, I'm not sure why they moved there, but uh, in their latter years, they did move there because his practice was there. And uh, I don't know exactly when he left Newark, I left his practice, but he left there and became a professor of dentistry at Howard University. If I'm correct, we have six members of the family on the phone, and I may have gotten this wrong, but it seems to me we've got three great, for whom Sarah and Charles are their great, great grandparents. Right. We have two people who are great, great, great grandparents and one person who is a great 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 grandparent am i correct so, right? um i'm not keeping up with it that way jane you are very good <laughs> alice would you um what do you think Denise? is that right <laughs> what do you think you have to ask denise, denise and debbie denise, <laughs> denise can figure it out <laughs> yeah We'll come back to that. Does anybody have any other questions for Betty? Perhaps about either the Hoey family or um, the YWCA itself, any questions? Kathleen Powers here. Lovely, lovely presentation, Betty. Thank you so much. Um, I had a question. She was a teacher, right? And where did, did she teach at all, Alice? She, Alice, Alice 
when she graduated from Howard University, she um, got a job uh, and it was at a boarding school. And the story behind that boarding school, I'm forgetting the details right now. It's, it's really another story within a story. Of course. Uh, it was sponsored by the American uh, Sunday, American Sunday School Society, Missionary Society. It was one of their sponsored schools in the South for African-American children. But the founder of that school also has a wonderful story. So Alice was only there for two years before she was called back home to help with the family business. And did she ever teach in Montclair then? No. No, never. Okay. Never. May I jump in there? She wouldn't have been able to, Kathleen, because Montclair schools were integrated. And as an African-American woman during that period, she wouldn't have been allowed to teach an integrated school. Right. Um, was the other Y um, started in Montclair at the time? The Y on Forest Street? The YMCA on Park Street. Oh, yes. Um, the the YMCA um, was prime from the start, as I understand it, was sponsored by the YMCA on Park Street. And they had um, a small place uh, up at, I think the address was 559 Bloomfield Avenue. Mm -hmm. uh, and they started, um, they were, I think they started around 1906. That was about the time they started their programs. The YMCA for oh. colored men, yes. And the YWCA that she founded was on what street? It started out uh, in 1911 on Forest Avenue at 89 Forest, mm -hmm. Forest Street, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. And then they moved to the Crane House at 159 um, Glen Ridge Avenue. Mm -hmm. I can also add to that, the, the YMCA, the one that's currently on Park Street, originally started out on Bloomfield Avenue. And the way the Ys were structured during that period, um, you would have a white YMCA or a white YWCA. And, um, and then if there was a need in the community, they could sort of found a, a small, another organization that was for the black community. So you'd have a big white YMCA and you'd have a, y, a black YMCA next to it. And that was the structure at every YMCA and YWCA throughout the United States, except for the one in Montclair. And the one in Montclair founded by Alice and those 17 women um, or 16 other women did never had a white YWCA in town. Right. And it was something that they were incredibly proud of because um, they did it on their own. They saw a need, they did it on their own. Um, and in a way they were bucking the system, but the national YWCA never quite knew how to deal with that and always referred to it as the Montclair situation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and they didn't become a part of uh, the national Y until 1953, where they were, they, the uh, national Y said, if you want to continue with our programming, then you have to integrate. <laughs> so that's uh, what happened there. And what I love, what I love with that is that they use the YWCA name for the program. Five years. Yeah. Now you'd be slapped with a lawsuit quicker than you could say right. YWCA. Now, what was the relationship with the Glenridge Avenue Y? That was the, a YWCA. It was just a, a change of location. They outgrew the Forest Street location oh, okay. and they needed a larger building. I see. Yeah. Betty, I I'm curious as to Sharon. Where, where do all of the family members who are on the Zoom with us to, tonight live? Are they all living in New Jersey? Yeah, I'm just, uh, just so happy to uh, be part of this. Because uh, like I said, I had no, no idea about my you know, father's, uh, my father was too busy raising girls. Nine of us, uh, well, mm. ended up with eight, one passed away. But it was, he raised eight of us and uh, he was pretty busy. <laughs> Working. Sounds um, like a hooey tradition to me. Sharon, yeah. that, <laughs> yeah. 
in the chat room, we also have that um, uh, Nicole is from Richmond, Virginia. Debbie is in Boynton Beach, and Victor mm -hmm. is in Monmouth Junction, New Jersey. Oh, good. Oh, well, well thank you. Oh, glad yeah. you all are. That's excellent. <laughs> Victor, did you have anything you'd like to share? We're so no, glad you could. I really appreciate uh, what you've done. Uh, my cousin Alice has been keeping me uh, informed on all the good work. And uh, I'm going to have to watch that show on uh, YouTube. Mm -hmm. Get more details. Yeah. <laughs> Get another hour in or so. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, you just pace yourself. <laughs> And what's so interesting is the show that she's got on that we have on YouTube on our on our website, well, on our YouTube channel, um, doesn't include some of this information too. So she could probably put together a three-hour presentation with all the information <laughs> gathered right now. So um, yeah, yeah, really, really interesting. The the research you found is really fascinating, um, and I thank you once again, Betty, for. For presenting it to us. I look forward to hearing in two years what else you found. So, <laughs> well, listen, I, I'm enjoying just sharing information with uh, Denise and the family and them sharing information with me. And, and Jane, whenever you find something, you send it to me. And, you know, there's still mm -hmm. corners in Montclair to, um, to dust off and take a look at. That's so, right. That's yeah. right. Um, so it's something for us to be proud of, this family, yeah. and their, what they established in this town. Yes. Well, thank you, Betty. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. I hope to see you in two weeks when we'll be doing our program with Joseph Smith, who is sometimes Joseph Smith, and he's sometimes Abe Lincoln, and he's sometimes uh, Frederick Law Olmsted, and he's all different sorts of people. So hope you join on for that. Uh, Hui family, you're welcome too, even though we're not talking about your family. So That's okay. So to you all, um, and uh, thank you. Stay safe and well, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Betty. This is great.